Okay, um, good evening everyone. So we've got um, a presentation now uh, on Zoom. So everyone is, uh, who's participating is, is dialed in. So thank you very much for your time, for dialing in. Um, feel free to stop me at any time if you have any questions. You can type your questions in or you can unmute yourself and, and just speak up and that's absolutely fine. I'm planning to speak for about um, 30 or 40 minutes. We'll see how it goes. Uh, I've got plenty of time for questions, so do feel free to stop me if there's any, any issues at all. Okay, so um, my name is Jonathan Lau. I'm one of the Kaplan trainers for CFA Level 1 and Level 2. I take the English courses. Uh, and this section, this, this uh, seminar is about um, you have passed Level 1 and you're looking to do Level 2 in May 2021. So uh, in, in sort of six months' time, okay? So that's, that's the plan. Okay, so this is a little bit about myself. Um, I'm originally from London. Um, I've got 12 years of uh, experience in financial services. I was first in, in corporate finance at Deutsche Bank, and then I moved across to the uh, fund management side. Um, I was on the research side and uh, worked for a couple of companies uh, there, um, most lately uh, Brooks McDonald Asset Management uh, for the last uh, last seven years of um, my financial services background. Um, and then I moved to Hong Kong. So for the last uh, four or five years, I have been training um, candidates on the CFA, CFA Level 1 and Level 2, as I've mentioned. Okay, so the agenda for today is to go through the level two exam in particular, of course. Um, and remember, we are talking about doing the May 2021 exam. And there are a number of different uh, exams that you can do. Okay, so I'm going to run through that. There's a lot of uh, new things to mention for, for the CFA, a lot of changes. Okay, importantly, the CFA has moved to uh, computer-based uh, examinations. And um, there's, there's some extra exams in place, uh, which I'm going to cover uh, in, in, a, in a minute. Okay, so lots of things to, to run through in terms of just the exam. Okay, so the, we'll split the, uh, the talk into two parts, uh, the exam and how it's composed and an effective learning approach as well. We'll add that here. And then the second part will just be um, a quick demo lecture for myself. Uh, on, on private equity. Okay, we'll just do a quick run through of a few slides uh, which you have in your pack or you should have if you have the download. Uh, we won't go through all of them. Okay, and then my colleague Yvette will run through the uh, student services and the offers um, after that. Okay, now as I mentioned, feel free to ask any questions at all um, if you have any. Okay, just, just feel free to take. Okay, brilliant. So, um, computer based exams. So, level two. So we've all passed our level one exams, so, so congratulations for passing your level one exams. So we don't need to care about level one. Okay, but what we're concerned about is level two, and what we're, we're really concerned about here is doing the exam uh, in May. Okay, so uh, level two and level three exams used to be uh, once a year in June, okay, but now they're moving to doing the exam twice a year. Okay, twice a year. But uh, next year is basically a transition year. Okay, so 2021, next year, is a bit of a transition year. So we've got um, extra exam windows. Okay, so uh, you can actually take the level two exam uh, in three different times, May, August, and November. Okay, and level three as well. Okay, but moving from 2022 onwards, it will be the twice a year, as we'll see in a second. Okay, but importantly, you cannot take... Uh, the adjacent exam window if it's less than six months, if less than six months. Okay, that's the important thing, okay, which we'll cover across in a second. Okay, so if you do the May exam as planned and, uh, and you fail it, unfortunately, you cannot uh, do the August exam, okay, because that's three months uh, gap and that's not long enough. Okay, six months and then you can. Okay, so that's, that's the key, which we'll run through again in a minute. Okay, so that's the key. Okay, so how about next year's exams? Next year's exams, so this is the normal schedule that they are aiming to, at least at uh, current, uh, 
and the current uh, plans. Okay, so this is the normal schedule where you can take level two twice a year and level three twice a year. Okay, and there will be February, August for level two and uh, May and November for for level three. Okay, so what does that mean? Okay, let's have a look at the um, path. Okay, so here again, we're planning to take um, level two exam in May 2021, about six months from now. Okay, now uh, let's say you, you, uh, you pass the exam, brilliant. Now what happens is you can take the next exam as long as there's a gap of six months. Okay, so which means the next exam is November 2021. Let me skip back and have a look. So we've passed May this time, and then we can take the next one in six months, which is November. Okay, you can't take the one in August, where you wouldn't really have enough time to even start preparing for level three. Anyway, okay, so that's, that's how it's going to work. Okay, so you take the November exam. If you pass that, then you get your charter after you complete your application, etc. Okay, so that's, that's the ideal scenario. Okay, if um, you fail level two's uh, May 2021 exam, then the next exam that you can take is the November 2021 exam. Okay, now if you remember, 2021, there's actually another one in August, but you cannot take that one because it's three months after your last sitting. Okay, so you cannot take the adjacent exam window if it's less than six months. Okay, so November will be the next one you can take. Okay, so then you could pass that one. Okay, um, there's also a level two August 2021 sitting. So if you were to take the August sitting, then how would that, how, how would that go? If you pass it, then you can take uh, the level three exam, but you need to wait at least six months, which means you then need to take the May 2022 exam, not the November 2021 ex exam, which is available but only to those who have sat it and passed it in May 2021 okay because again that's three months so you need to have a gap of more than uh, at least six months okay and let's say if you take the level two August 2021 exam and you fail it um, the next exam that you can take for level two the reset is going to be in February 2022 and again that means you cannot take you can't take the November 21 exam Okay, because that's August, November, three months, too, too short, too soon. Okay, so you need to take the February 2022 exam. Is that okay? Is that, is that clear? That makes sense? Okay, it's a little bit complicated. In particular, it's a little bit complicated for next year because you've got these extra exams that you, you can take, but then going on forwards, it should be fairly straightforward. The, the exams are kind of spaced out six months. Okay, uh, topic area weights. So... We've got the weightings for the 10 areas, okay? And what you can see here, we're looking at level two exam and uh, there are ranges, okay? So if you've, uh, if you've recently done, uh, what well, level one in the past has always been uh, a, a set percentages. Now they've moved to ranges as well, okay? So level one, level two, and level two, all of them are now ranges, okay? So what does that mean? It means you need to adapt your uh, exam technique. Okay, so now it's always been that the exam is about coverage. Okay, fine. But uh, in level one, perhaps in the past, you know, if you had a, a relatively small percentage in, let's say, derivatives, which may have been like 5% in the past, you might have been able to sort of briefly run through it, knowing that it's only going to be 5% of the exam. Okay, that's no longer uh, something that you should really do. It's a bit dangerous. Okay, so for example, uh, you know, you're not so strong on economics. It could just be 5% of the exam, which might be okay, but it could be 10% of the exam, okay? So it's now it's a much bigger risk for you to take, okay? So they are, they are ranges, meaning you need to really go through all the different topic areas. Um, you, it's fairly risky to skip a whole topic in particular. Okay, now we're gonna run through exactly how this exam works. Um, they're, they're gonna be vignettes, okay? What does that mean? That means item sets, okay? So level two is all about item sets which means they give you uh, a page and a half of, of information, perhaps, up to a page and a half of, of data. And then they will typically ask you, well, they'll ask you between four to six questions on that information. If it was six questions, that would be 5% of the exam in the past. Okay, this is actually in the past. Okay, but we'll go through um, how, that, how that runs through uh, 
in a minute. Okay, and you're going to aim to get 65 to 70 percent of the uh, uh, as a as a pass rate again. Okay, if you get 70 percent of the marks correct, then you will pass the exam. Okay, same as before. Okay, so we're looking at May uh, 2021 as the exam, but actually it's an exam window. Okay, so now it's all computer based. So you're going to turn up to the uh, exam hall, and there's going to be lots of computers in front of you. Okay, so that, that's the difference, that's the big difference going forwards, okay? And what that means is you're going to be able to uh, go in, uh, get yourself registered for the exam, and select a date that you want to sit the exam. Okay, so before, the exams are always on the weekend, Saturdays, uh, it used to be six hours. Okay, now the exam is uh, four and a half hours in total. Okay, so you've got two exams as before, so two and a quarter hours each. For, for for two exams, okay, for two exams, okay, so it's reduced in time, okay, before it was six hours, so it's an hour and a half shorter this time, okay, so, but it's all computer, which means, I guess, they'll have a limited number of computers, and so you, they, they'll spreading it out across this exam window, okay, so you have to book uh, when, when, when you want the exam, okay, which is, is perhaps good, you know, it gives you more flexibility, if you don't like a Saturday exam, you can do it on a Thursday, or whatever, okay. Now this is the old uh, format for how they uh, how we would uh, do the exam. We'd have vignettes, as I mentioned. Okay, so vignettes, and we have between four and six questions per vignette per item set. Okay, now they haven't specified exactly how they're going to uh, dis distribute the questions. I am going to. I, I think there is that we're moving more and more towards four question item sets. Okay, that's the, that's the sort of trend that we're seeing. Okay, so it used to be six question item sets, but now they uh, last year they added uh, the flexibility to do do four questions, and I think that's that's the way they're going. Okay, this is the old format. This was for the six hour exam, two three hour papers, but now of course we've moved to a shorter exam, so I would expect more four item uh, vignettes. Okay, but very similar to before. Okay, and each of those vignettes, you know, it is possible for one of those item sets to be on one reading in the ex in the uh, in the curriculum. Okay, which means again, very uh, you need to be careful. Make sure you've at least covered all of the topics. Okay, it's all about coverage. Not always. Okay, some of the vignettes, particularly if they're going to be six question vignettes, they may cover more than one reading. Okay, may they may co cover more than than one reading. There'll be there'll be questions on different parts. Of the topics. Okay, and as before, you're going to have a combination of calculation questions and narrative questions. Okay, as before, so you need to 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 to, to study both both types of questions. Okay, what about the pass rates? Um, okay, so the pass rates for uh, 2019 here uh, they're slightly higher than level one. Okay, so that's a good thing. So usually they, they seem to be slightly higher in sort of all in the past number of years, a few, a few extra percentage points, and more people pass level two than pass level one. Okay, but that's probably the only good, good thing you can see here. Okay, to be honest, it's still a relatively low pass rate. And of course, as we'll come on to, you know, who are the people who are sitting level two? They're the people who have already passed level one. Okay, so your competition's higher. Okay, we'll come on to that in a minute. Okay, and as usual, uh, we are going to try and target 70% if possible, 65 to 70%. Okay, that's the target. Okay, if you hit 70, you will pass, no matter how easy the exam is. Okay, so 70% is is the is the rate to go for, uh, is the uh, the mark to go for if you can. Okay, and we're s of course we're still waiting for our 2020 results, which is why we don't have 2020 because they were postponed and moved to December 2020. So they're still waiting for the 2020 results, which were moved uh, because of all the uh, all the virus that we've got this year. Okay, so uh, so you've passed level one, and now we're looking at doing level two. Or you may have already done level two before. Have, have either of you guys done level two before? You've done it. Okay. Okay. Fine. Brilliant. Brilliant. Okay. So we've got someone who's done level two before. I mean, okay. The the topics are are all. I mean, it's still the same ten topics. Okay. But uh, you know what? What we're we fighting for in level one. In level one, the big problem was volume. Okay, volume. Lots and lots of information. Okay, really, really heavy on the information, uh, but not too tricky. I think if you get your head around it. Okay, not too tricky. Now, it, level one, level two is a bit of a continuation. Okay, 
So we tried to recommend if you've done level one recently, great, do level two, and then if you really want to, you could take a break between level two and level three, perhaps. Okay, because they do expect you to know and understand the information for level one, and then it's it's more of a, a, a great in-depth understanding for level two. Okay, so they're building on the building blocks of level one. Okay, and level two is is just trickier. Okay, so they are trickier questions, less questions, so you're less time pressured. Okay. Uh, and there's still a lot, okay? They don't really let up on the volume, but, but they're, they're, they are harder questions. And you, as I mentioned, they are item sets, which means they have more information to throw at you and they can, they can make the questions a bit more tricky, okay? Now, if you have studied finance before, then, you know, it is possible to get through level one with less work, okay? You know, it is, it is, it is easier. I, um, you study finance and accounting or economics, uh, you, you can probably get away with a bit less, less study, okay? But level two, um, is is trickier and it does that they, they do ask you things that you won't really they don't generally come up uh, some things at least don't generally come up in in sort of just doing a degree in, in finance or accounting or that kind of thing okay so you do need more time okay for level two okay I would say okay so I don't know, level one how much time did you guys do you guys remember a bit far back maybe but how much time did you spend studying for level one like uh, three months four months yeah, a bit more than that. Okay, so whatever you spent on level one, more for level two, I would say. Okay, you know, relative to yourself, you know, level two is harder than level one. You definitely need to spend more time. Okay, and and just to hammer home the point. Okay, so as we mentioned before, um, you know, who are you competing against? You're competing against the people who've already passed level one. Okay, so that that everyone is 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 has um, has more information, more knowledge. And uh, and you need to um, up your game as as they will try as well. Okay, the people that are sitting level two, not only have they passed level one, a third of them at least have also done level two before. Okay, so of course people fail because the pass rate is so low. So a number of those level two candidates that you're competing with for May 2021 are people who've already done it before. Okay, so of course they've got an advantage. They've already covered the material once. Okay, so again, um, just just beware. Okay. Now, as I mentioned, the pass rate still pretty low, but it's slightly higher than level one. Okay, that's the only good point, um, but but still pretty competitive. Okay, so 44% uh, for two years ago, but we're still waiting for 2020's results, as I mentioned. Okay, so so and, and I think that's 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 mentioned. Okay, so let's run through uh, the course okay so um, there's three phases to the to the course that we offer uh, you've got a, a nine week basically a nine week uh, education phase where we run through the key concepts I run through the key concepts uh, with you um, then we have a re revision section which is again is about four and a half weeks where we're running through questions and then there's the four and a half hour mock. Okay, so again, it's changed. The exam is no longer six hours. It's going to be four and a half hours in total. Two hours and 15 minutes, two hours and 15 minutes. You'll do that. I think we'll do that on the weekend. And then I will run through uh, uh, the exam uh, the following, uh, like Wednesday or Thursday evening. Okay, so that's, that's, the to that's the overall what happens. Okay, so in the education phase, okay, it's very similar to... Um, to level one uh, course with Kaplan, if you've done the level one course with me, okay, or with one of the other trainers, um, level one is where we walk through, we run through uh, a number of the key concepts. We don't run through every single topic, every single LOS. We cannot, we don't have the time. So we're going to focus on the important parts, okay, and focus on the understanding as much as possible and the highly testable material, okay, in particular. Okay, that's the key. And then we'll do we'll do some questions during during the course, and we'll have more questions in the in the packs. Okay, so we'll please feel free to have a look at the packs. That those of you who are here uh, in person, just uh, have a look later. Uh, so you will run through those uh, the four slide books. Okay, the, and they will have um, extra questions at the back, uh, some of which we may go through during the course. Um, and of course, you always have uh, uh, questions in the curriculum as well. But doing questions is the key. Okay, doing lots and lots of questions is really important, in particular for level two, I would say, but level one as well. Okay, so the revision section, what is that? Again, four and a half weeks, we're running through lots and lots of questions. Okay, so we're giving you guys time to do questions in class, and then I run through them. Okay, and we'll and we'll review key topics, key materials, tricky questions. 
Okay, and that's that's the key. That's that's uh, that's um, that's part of the course. Okay, and then again, the finally, if you want to do the exam, that's a four and a half hour exam, closer to your exam. Okay, and that's um, uh, that'll be uh, closer to to the exam window, as we mentioned. Okay. Okay, so that is the um, the run through on the on the exam and, and everything. Is there any you guys have any questions? Anyone online have any questions? Do feel free to to type in the chat if you have any questions. Oh, I will I will hang back afterwards as well. Anyway, I'm just I'm going to do a quick demo lecture on uh, private equity as I mentioned, and then um, and then we'll take it from there. You guys okay? Any questions? Sure. Okay, so let's do a quick demo lecture on, uh, just run through a few of the slides, okay? So that's what we're doing. Uh, trying to pick something that we can run through and, and have, a, have a bit of a chat about uh, in the limited time that we have. Okay, just one point to note. Okay, so in the, in the slide packs, what you have here is you'll have each of the slides will have a, a link to the LOS. Okay, so that means you can very easily flick back to the curriculum or to the Schreiser books. I mean, generally speaking, we'd look at the Schreiser books first because the curriculum itself is very, very uh, uh, dry, I'd say. Okay, so really go through the, the Schreiser notes first and see if that, that will help you um, um, explain some of these topics in a bit more detail. Okay, so uh, let's go through private equity. Okay, so alternative investments is one of the smaller topics and the weightings. I think it's 5 to 10%. Okay, uh, so it, it was it's it's relatively small. Okay, um, in level one they really focused on hedge funds. Okay, so for level one they c they covered hedge funds, but in level two um, we cover more private equity. We cover more real estate, both public and private, and we cover a bit of commodities as well. Okay, so. I'd say that's more the focus for alternative investments in level two. Okay. Okay. So quickly then, uh, private equity. Okay. So what is private equity? We're taking companies private. Okay. And uh, they may already be private, and we just we invest in them, or they may be public. In other words, they're listed somewhere, listed on a stock exchange, and we take them private and we invest in them. Okay. Now, how are we going to create value? Just a very top-down overview. Uh, we're going to try and re-engineer the firm and, uh, and cut costs, maybe, or try and try and grow them somehow. Okay, now how do we do that? As a private equity firm, we may have uh, more expertise. We may have more specialized managers. Okay, so we might be a healthcare private equity fund, and therefore we have access to a lot of former healthcare CEOs, and we can give you good advice and that kind of thing. Okay, we can we may be able to bring some expertise and, and onboard some some good managers. Okay. Um, other ways that you can help as a fund, uh, maybe we can have access, we should have access to, to better debt financing. Okay, We, we, we buy or, or, or take over uh, and make, uh, make a good investment in your company. We may be able to um, get better uh, debt financing because we have closer relationships with the bank. Okay, that kind of thing. Okay, now and importantly, the big one here is, uh, is is aligning the goals between us as a PE owners and the management of the team. Okay, so here it's all all about the term sheet. Okay, what terms are we buying uh, this investment? Okay, so on alignment of economic interests, you know, if we can take the company private, then that means perhaps we can focus more on long term. Okay, why? Because if you're short, if you're publicly traded, you're listed. You know, what are they looking at? They're looking at like next quarter's earnings, and they c they're looking very, very short term. Okay, whereas if they're private, then away from prying eyes, they, we we're going to build up the firm for the next three or five years, and then we're going to sell it. That's the big, that's and we make our money. Okay, and and if we're private, we can do things uh, out of the prying eyes, and, and we don't focus on short term performance. Okay, and we can concentrate on this as well because we've also linked. Manager's performance to to uh, the performance of the company. Okay, that's important. Okay, so so before they may not have so much of a vested interest, but if we add along a tag along clause, for example, then the management has exit rights if the P firm sells its stake. So if the company does a good job, management does a good job, the management get rewarded in bonuses, shares, options. Okay, and they can get some very lucrative bonuses here, and that really drives them. Okay, it will drive anyone. 
Okay, and you can actually make this go either way, right? You can say, oh, if we do really well, we'll give you more equity. Or um, if we don't do so well, we'll give you less. Okay, you can do it either way. Right? You, can, you can reward them, carrot or stick. Okay, it's up to you. Okay, now there's two key uh, uh, approaches, I guess, to private equity, two main um, types of investments. Okay, you've got venture capital and you've got leverage buyouts. Okay, venture capital and leverage buyouts. And then the curriculum really runs through uh, and asks questions about the differences between the two. Okay, so uh, venture capital, what are we looking at here? We're looking at um, startup investing. Okay, we're looking at investing in someone's crazy idea. That's the that's venture capital. And then later on, we're going to go through buyouts. Okay, so they're 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 quite different. Okay, so venture capital. Firstly, then, if you're investing in someone's crazy idea, then cash flow is unpredictable. Okay, really not sure what's going to happen. It's just some new tech. Someone's 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 crazy idea. Okay, uh, asset base is weak. You know, they're, they're really just starting out. Maybe they're starting from the garage, but you know, hopefully they're not in the garage by the time you come to invest in it. Uh, but they're still relatively small. Okay, so when you're when you're investing in them, you are investing basically in equity. Okay, there's no assets to speak of in which they can borrow. You won't lend money, uh, give a big loan to an entrepreneur. Uh, generally, if they've got no experience and they've just started out their company. Okay, but you as an investor will, will might be happy to take on a big uh, uh, take on their risk if you're going to get a lot of equity in their business. Okay, hopefully management team has a strong entrepreneurial record. Okay, but the risk is really hard to measure. Okay, because it's a, it's a new company. Okay, so later on we won't do it today, but uh, in the in the later on later topics we go through valuation and how to tr go about trying to value some of these investments, and we'll be looking at using risk-free rates, not risk-free rates, um, interest rates of twenty percent, twenty-five percent, forty percent. Okay, it's really, really high risk. Okay, because you could lose all your money. Often you will lose all your money. Okay. Exit strategy we'll go through in a bit, but uh, you know, if we can IPO it, fantastic. Okay, so if, if we can make an investment in the next Uber or the next Facebook, you know, and we IPO it, then we've made a lot of money and we're very happy. Okay, but it's pretty hard. You know, it's it's uh, out of ten investments, we'd expect nine of them to go bust or to to not really make any return at all, not a sizable return at least. Okay, but that one out of ten, we're hoping does very, very well for us, okay? Um, that's that's sort of the, that's what you're looking at. Okay, operations, high cash burn, because you're, you're a new company, um, low capital, low working capital requirements, um, capital's really required for growth, and uh, yeah, so, main uh, money you're going to get as a venture capital investor is uh, carried interest. So you're going to get uh, the, the the company's going to grow, and you're going to get a lot of performance fees, performance return from from that. Okay, that's where you're going to get it, as opposed to uh, setting up and and monitoring. Okay, not not really from that. Okay, so that is venture capital. Okay, on the other side then, buyouts, buyouts or leverage buyouts. What is that? Now here we are targeting. Cash flow stable and predictable companies. Okay, why? Because this is when we are taking on lots of debt. Okay, this is a, a very different from venture capital. Okay, so we are looking at borrowing as much money as we can, basically. Okay, as much as we can, as much as the banks will lend us, we will pile on the debt and and uh, and you know use that to buy the company. Yeah, put some of your own money in, but hopefully not too much. Use, you know, so if the company doesn't have any debt, brilliant, you can borrow lots of money. But you can only borrow lots of money if the cash flows are stable and predictable. Okay, so you again, think of a bank. The bank will only lend lots of money if you are a lawyer, for example. You know, high, high earnings, high salary, not, maybe not such a big bonus, but you've got a high salary and it's stable. Okay? Happy to lend you lots of money because you, you've got that salary there. It's high cash flow, stable and predictable. They're not willing to lend so much money to an artist, you know, just kept coming out, you know, don't know if he's going to make it or not. Highly volatile earnings. Okay, so same thing. You're looking for stable and predictable cash flows. These are the targets for these sort of leverage buyouts. Okay, because then they can borrow lots and lots of money. 
And these tend to be established companies with a substantial asset base. Okay, so this is not someone's crazy idea. These companies have been around for a while. Um, you know, they, they, they're pubs. They're, you know, these kinds of companies. They may not be massive companies, but they could be quite big companies. Okay, so they tend to be companies with. Um, they tend to be bigger, so they already have an established management team, perhaps. Okay. Um, so. That means the risks are more manageable. Okay, you know what this kind of business does, and these kinds of investments are way more popular and way more, uh, in terms of numbers, much bigger than venture capital. Actually, okay, so these are, this is the, the main thing. If you talk, if you think about private equity, buyouts is the main 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 type of investment. Okay, and the ex exit strategy is is it tends to be predictable. Okay, again, you will try and uh, and reduce costs where possible. Okay, because you're all about the profit. You 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 just want to make lots of money. Okay, so here, rare failures, low variability of success. So it's much much more predictable, as we said. Okay, so here, um, you're looking at uh, buying an investment and getting a certain IRR, internal rate of return. Okay, what kind of IRR do you think we're looking at here? Any idea what kind of internal rate of return we're targeting if we are if we are a buyout firm and looking for a suitable investment? What percentage are we looking at? Any idea? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Twenty percent might be a little low, but maybe sort of twenty-five percent plus. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's 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 great. Yeah. So twenty-five percent a year is what you're looking for, and you will get it most of the time. You know what price you can pay, and uh, you know what you're looking to sell it for. Okay, it's much more predictable. And uh, you're going to get your, uh, your, your fees again from capital interest, but as well as transaction and monitoring fees. Okay, now valuation issues uh, in private equity. So if we are looking at leveraged buyouts, okay, now we're looking at mature companies perhaps, but very stable cash flow, so we can use our discounted cash flow model, which is great. So this is a valid approach to valuing a buyout investment. Okay, so you can see. Uh, what the value is quite easily, but if you're looking at venture capital, remember someone's crazy idea. Now it's much harder to use DCF because you don't know uh, they're not. They're probably not generating much in terms of cash flows. We're talking about five, ten years in the future. Okay, much, much more unpredictable. What about relative value? Okay, if we're using buyouts, relative value. We're talking about um, transaction comps or trading comps. Okay, we're looking at P ratios or EV EBITDA ratios. Okay, so that's fine, and again, we can use that to make sure that our DCF is at a as a decent number. Okay, so we can use it to cross-check our DCF valuation. Okay, if we're looking at venture capital, no comps, right? Because it's someone's new technology and a new field. Very hard to have any to have any useful comps here. Okay, so really tricky to value venture capital. Okay, what else? Use of debt. Now, as you mentioned, buyout. Use of debt is going to be high. Okay, that's the whole point. You're going to you're going to pile on as much debt as you can into this investment, and then pay it down three or five years, and then sell it, and that's how you're going to make lots of money. Okay, and then the debt it will be a relatively low percentage you're paying, hopefully, and your company's growing, growing, and your earnings is is the yield on the uh, company. The earnings yield is going to be much higher, and you're going to make uh, you're going to make good money. In terms of venture capital, we are looking at investing in equity, not debt. We're not, we're not really looking at that debt at all because it's a newish company. Okay, now in terms of return drivers then for a buyout company, you are going to try and grow the earnings per share. Okay, you're going to try and, and reduce operational inefficiencies as we mentioned. Okay, that's hope, hopefully we can do that. Okay, we're going to bring in our expertise and try and do that as much as possible. We're going to hope for PE expansion, okay, we're going to buy at a 10 times PE, hopefully sell it on a 20 times PE. If we can, that would be brilliant. Okay, but these are question marks, I would say. Okay, these are not the main drivers. I think the main driver actually is just debt reduction. Okay, you know you're borrowing f how much, you know the debt's going to be uh, how, much, how much leverage you're putting on and, and how much your interest costs are, and you're going to reduce the debt as you go, as you, as, as the company, uh, as you, as you go three years, five years down the line, the debt's going to reduce and you're going to be able to sell this company for more. Okay, this is the key, debt reduction. That's the whole point. Levered buyout, leveraged buyout, leveraged taking on debt. Okay, that's the key. You know, when the companies uh, invest, you know, they're going to they're going to project what they're going to make, of course. Okay, and if they and if they are sensible, they will they will be cautious in what PE they can sell it for. If they buy at 10 times PE, they will suggest they can just sell it 10 times. They're not going to do 20 times. Okay, they're going to be cautious. They want to leave a big margin there. 
Okay, now if you're a venture capital company, what are the key return drivers? Um, this is something we, we talk more about in later modules. Um, we'll go through how they value it using those rel relatively high uh, required returns, uh, pre-money valuation, and, and looking at uh, future dilution from other, other investors as well. Okay, and that's, um, that's one way we can look at invest, uh, valuing and, and uh, venture capital investments. Okay, now just quickly to round off, let me just do a couple more slides on the exit. Okay, so um, we've bought the company, now we want to sell it. Okay, now this is done in order of, uh, of value, let's say. Okay, so the, the, the best one is first. Okay, so you buy a company and then if you can IPO it, then you should get the highest exit value. Okay, this is, this is when you make lots of money, great. High liquidity, access to capital, attract good management. Why do you attract good management? Remember, this is a private company that you've owned. Now you're listing it, and then you can probably attract better management, okay? Because uh, now you're a listed company, now people have heard of you, and you can offer them shares, you can offer them options, you know, you can give them performance um, um, incentives, okay? So that's, that's great. The bad things about IPOing is it's more costly. Okay, you need to go and get the, uh, all the banks to run their due diligence, do your road shows, okay, bankers' fees. Do you know how much it, how much it costs to IPO, to go to, to run through? How much do you have to pay the banks for an IPO in terms of percentages of the, of the value? You know, we're talking 5, 6, 7%. Okay, they're big, big big amounts of money that you have to pay to the banks in order to get the I to, to do the IPO. And it's a lot of work, okay? So the banks do earn their money in terms of the hours that they put in. They will, they, they, they do uh, put in a fair amount of work in terms of, of, of having, uh, running an IPO. Okay, and uh, the timing is key, okay? Now, if you're doing an IPO, uh, it, you're often, it just depends on what the market's like, okay? If the market is, is doing really well, and lots of IPOs are, are happening at, at nice, nice levels, then great, you're gonna make lots of money. But, you know, if it was, say, London in 2008, you know, global financial crisis, 2009, that year, I think there were no IPOs in London, okay? So, you know, that's, timing's obviously very important, and you may not, you will have no control over that, um, uh, at the market, at least. Okay, what else? Secondary market sale, okay? So, um, you could just sell your company, to another one for strategic reasons. Okay, so you've bought a pub company. Now you're gonna sell it to another drinks chain, okay? And uh, this is good because if you're gonna sell it to them, and they, they obviously they want to buy you, then they should pay a markup, they should pay a premium. Okay, so this should give you a good valuation, I would say. Secondary market sale should, be, should give you a nice valuation. Okay. Um, Management buyout. So here you've uh, you you know you're going to sell the firm to the management, and they are going to put on leverage. Okay, so this is a bit like another leverage buyout. Okay, and this is probably not going to be as as lucrative because again, if you're if you're going to do a leverage buyout, you know what price you you're you can willing you're willing to pay in order to get that 25% return year on year on year. Okay, it can't be very much. Okay, so this is not fantastic. Okay, that's why number three. Okay, and the worst is liquidation. Okay, you've, you've decided uh, the firm's not making money, you're just gonna liquidate it, sell it bankrupt. Okay, obviously the worst, the worst uh, choice here. Okay. So actually, um, I would say number two gives you the best return for your bucks. Why? Because if you are doing an IPO, you're gonna sell how much of your company? Maybe 10% of your company, 20% of your company. Are you gonna sell at a premium? You're not gonna sell at a premium, okay? You're selling to lots of investors. They might be big investors, pension funds. The pension fund will take 1%. Another uh, big mutual fund will take half a percent. You know, you're selling to lots of people, you're gonna be selling to them at a discount, right? IPOs, they often take a little bump up, don't they? After the IPO, they often go up by 20%. Okay, because they price it in such a way that it's attractive to people to get involved and to buy a little bit and to get that little bump. Okay, so you're actually selling at a discount. Okay, whereas when you sell other secondary markets, now this company is buying the entire company and paying a premium. Okay, so they're very different. Okay, so I mean, if you are, if companies are really, are really big, then maybe IPO is the only possibility. Okay, because if you are Facebook, who's going to buy Facebook? You know, there's no 
not many companies that can buy Facebook. Okay, so therefore, highest exit value in that case. Okay, but if we're talking about like a s relatively small pub chain, then maybe a secondary market sale might be give you the better valuation. Okay, so for one and two, it just depends. Okay, it's a little bit not not quite straightforward as highest valuation perhaps. Okay, but of course, if you are looking to sell out completely, then number two. If you want to keep control, you can just sell 10%, you're still CEO. Okay, so they're just slightly different. Okay, um, I'm, going to, I'm going to stop there. Okay, so if there's any questions on, on anything else, just let me know. Uh, you know. You're just going to run through a bit of fees here, which we'll run through in the course. You can have a look at the slides and a few risks of private equity investing, uh, lots of risks here. Okay, so I'm going to leave that there. And I'm going to hang around after for any questions if you have them. Uh, oh, you have any questions now? Feel free to take them to take any questions. Yeah, go for it. For the okay, uh, yeah. So ideally, you're you're here, and uh, we can we can just have questions. We'll have breaks. Uh, you can ask me questions before class. After class, uh, during the breaks, you can you can also email me during the during the week if you have any questions as well. Um, if you're online, um, it's harder. Okay, so ideally you're here, but uh, online you can also t you can type as well. You can type type some questions. The problem with online is sometimes uh, it's harder to 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 really get to the crux of it. So ideally you're here and we can ask we can talk to each other and that's the best. Yeah, absolutely. Good question. Any other questions online? Anyone got any questions online? Okay, I'm going to hang around after, so um, Yvette will carry the last part.